Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for a learning and growing webinar on excessive sugar, sugar sweetened beverage consumption among college students implications for mood behavior learning and cognition. Our presenter today is Professor Gerard Brown, Brown of Concordia University, St. Paul, Minnesota. My name is Sidra and I'll be your moderator today for Hawks Learning. We will have a live Q&A session after the presentation, so please enter any questions you have into the Q&A as we go, and we'll answer them at the end. I'll now hand it over to our presenter. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope all of you are doing well today. Thank you so much for signing up for today's webinar presentation. We're gonna take a deep dive into the world of sugar today. This is an interesting topic that I don't think is talked about that much within the realm of like college students and academic learning, but there's actually quite a few studies on this topic. So we're gonna learn about this topic and really dig into the implications it has for students learning their memory, their attention, how stress factors into this, how physical health issues factor into this, how mental health challenges factor into this. If you have any questions, just type them in the Q&A box. If you think of questions after the fact, don't hesitate. Shoot me an email at this email address listed on this slide. Here's a copy of my brief professional biography. I'm a professor, trainer, researcher, and consultant do a lot of work in the area of trauma and forensic mental health, but I started becoming interested in the topic of sugar quite a long time ago now, and I've been doing more and more podcasts on the topic. I'm writing articles on this topic and really fascinated with this through an academic lens, but also through a mental health and behavioral lens. Here's a copy of today's training description, along with the training objectives, which I believe you already have in advance. But let's talk briefly about sugar. What in the world is sugar? It's really complicated, actually, kind of at a biochemical level. But sugar, really think of it as a sweet carbohydrate. It provides sources of energy in our diet. And sugar converts to glucose in our body. Sugar is not a bad thing in and of itself. We need sugar to survive because glucose is metabolic fuel. Our brains need it, but it really depends on what kind of sugar that we're consuming in terms of if it's from a sugar-sweetened beverage, how much, and when. Unfortunately, we know from the research that a very high percentage of individuals in the United States consume way more sugar than what is recommended by established guidelines. And we're going to talk a lot about sugar sweetened beverages today, obviously, but there's plenty of studies that are showing that excessive sugar consumption is really a threat to our emotional, physical, behavioral, and cognitive health. If you look at this research, if you dig deep into this, why do we want to care about this? Because excessive sugar consumption may also play a role in a number of non-communicable diseases. So if you're not familiar with this particular topic, really just think of these as more chronic diseases. It can relate to cardiovascular issues, so issues with our heart, it may increase risk of strokes under certain circumstances. It may increase the risk of certain kinds of cancers. It's been linked obviously to diabetes, but there are a lot of other factors we need to take into account besides sugar that could play a role in the increase in non-communicable diseases that we're seeing in our society. Tobacco use, drug use, alcohol use, if people live a sedentary lifestyle, they don't get a lot of movement or exercise, other types of unhealthy eating habits, and even air pollution exposure has been talked about within the context of non-communicable diseases. This is a fantastic resource if any of you want to learn more about the topic of sugar. This is a great website to take a look at. I will share my slides with anyone who emails me. 
It's sugarscience.ucf sf.edu they have a number of different resources on their site related to like evidence-based kinds of science studies related to the impact sugar has on health and wellness sugar has many different names so we want to be aware of this when you're like reading food labels and things of that nature there are just countless names that are found in products that are actually just sugar, but they may have fancy names to it. When we think of this through that sugar sweetened beverage lens, we know that sugar sweetened beverages are loaded with sugar, but there's a number of other ingredients we want to be aware of. When you study the topic of sugar as well, I would highly recommend understanding high fructose corn syrup. You're gonna find a lot of literature on that. We're going to talk a little bit about the Western diet today, fast food consumption, ultra processed foods, food addiction a little bit today. So we're going to get, we're going to scratch the surface with a lot of these topics, but this topic definitely has implications for, I think, anyone working in the academic arena. Now, the question comes up in this research literature quite often is the fact is, is excessive sugar consumption a true addiction. There's some controversy around that. Some studies say yes, some studies say it might be more habit forming, but whatever camp you fall on, I have consulted on many cases where a client by all accounts appears to be highly addicted to sugar. What is going on at the neurological biochemical level when we're thinking about excessive sugar consumption through this addiction risk? What could be going on? High levels of stress have been linked to excessive sugar consumption. Why is that the case? Because in the short term, high amounts of sugar can be very comforting. It can help people cope with stress in the short term. In the long term, it can make the stress actually worse. It can inflame the body. It's been linked to more pain problems, more daytime fatigue. For some people too, it can have an altering mood effect. For some people, they may consume high amounts of sugar because it gives them somewhat of a high. It gives them somewhat of a distraction, but we wanna be aware of that sugar crash that often is intimate after someone consumes a high degree of sugar. If you look at this literature, if you study sugar, if you study nutrition and food, you're gonna come across the topic of junk food addiction. This is another topic that might have some controversy to it. We know from the research literature, if you are working in academia, college students have a tendency to consume a high amount of junk food ultra processed foods, fast foods. If you think about this topic, what do we need to take into account? Typically, this is going to constitute the Western diet. We're gonna talk a little bit about that today. But if you are consuming high amounts of junk food, fast food, really think of it as an ultra processed type of food. A lot of times these foods are loaded with like added colorings, flavors, emulsifiers, different kinds of thickeners. Typically, they have lower levels of fiber in them, protein, potassium, zinc, magnesium, and they also typically have lower levels of vitamin A, C, D, E, B3, B12, and the list goes on. The reason why I point that out is if people rely heavily on just consuming ultra processed foods, junk food, fast food, they're typically not going to be getting the needed nutrients, the minerals, the vitamins they need to support their brain and body health. Interestingly, if you study some of the fast food consumption literature, excessive amounts of fast food consumption have been linked to increases in depression, it's been linked to increases in anxiety, sleep problems. We'll talk a little bit about metabolic dysfunction today. So that could be blood sugar dysregulation issues, issues with cholesterol, and the list goes on. In this literature too, we want to be aware of the topic of refined food addiction. This is going to be foods that are primary. What you'll find under this umbrella is gonna be more soft drinks, 
drinks that are loaded with sugar, high amounts of caffeine. This could be fast food, of course. So people are consuming maybe high amounts of like French fries, which we know are loaded with fat, salt, and other kinds of things. People consume a lot of like donuts or just other kinds of sugar sweetened beverages or other kinds of sugar sweetened snacks. These are things that could lead to potential addictive like behaviors in some individuals. Typically, if people eat this way, they are not going to be consuming a lot of vegetables or fruits. One intervention I'll say right now is to work with a nutritionist. Maybe if you're working in that college setting, providing some psychoeducation classes to your students about these topics has been highly recommended. And some research points to the fact that if you can help people consume more fruits and vegetables, that can actually decrease the likelihood of that person having like ongoing food addiction problems. But again, doing that in conjunction with like a qualified nutritionist would be highly recommended. This is a fascinating topic that has significant implications for all of us. A high percentage of people in the United States and around the world consume a diet that would be classified as the Western diet. If you're not familiar with this topic, these are gonna be diets that are rich in processed energy dense foods that have a lot of refined sugars in them, trans fatty acids, high amounts of sodium. Typically they lack plant-based foods. So you're not getting a lot of vegetables again with this. They're typically loaded with calories. Under this umbrella, sugar sweetened beverages would fall under this category. Fried foods, processed and unprocessed red meats, refined grains, unhealthy snacks, desserts would fall under this umbrella. And what the research has found is again, that people that consume a diet consistently in the Western diet may be at greater risk for obesity, chronic inflammation. It's been linked to having more allergies. The diabetes epidemic is absolutely related to this. Again, there's other factors to take into account. The Western diet has also been linked with having more autoimmune problems, more depression, other types of neurological or neuropsychiatric issues. I have all kinds of things underlined on this slide. This particular slide is a whole day training in and of itself. We want to be aware that eating habits like this can contribute to increases in inflammation in the body. Chronic low-grade inflammation has been linked with different disorders, illnesses, and diseases. This way of eating has been shown to negatively impact our brain. So this has significant implications for learning. As we get older, if we eat this way consistently, it's been linked to more cognitive decline. This hippocampal dysfunction, why do you wanna care about this? Because this has a lot to do with memory. This could impact one's memory. And it's also been linked to having more blood brain barrier dysfunction. There's a lot going on in this slide. Just know that this way of eating has been linked to all kinds of problematic behaviors and patterns. This is another slide that is multiple hours of content packed into this one slide. Know that people that consume high amounts of sugar, people that consume high amounts of processed foods, that has been linked to more changes in our hormones. Why do we wanna care about that? because hormones really are linked to everything in our body, the way we think, our, our mood, our energy level, our sleep, everything is linked back to hormones. And this can contribute to more hormonal imbalance. When people have more imbalances in their hormones, this has been linked to more chronic headaches, infertility issues, higher levels of irritability, it's been linked to more emotional problems. It's been linked to more brain fog. The list goes on. This nucleus accumbens here that I have underlined, if any of you are like in the neuroscience world, this, this part of the brain has a lot to do with goal-directed behaviors. So if you ever are working with somebody and developing some sort of a goal plan 
or intervention plan, I highly recommend learning about this part of the brain. Again, the hippocampus has a lot to do with memory. Again, these parts of the brain, there's a lot more to them than, than that. And this is the prefrontal cortex. This is one of the most important topics that college professors should absolutely know about. This is the hub of reasoning, learning, and logic in our brain. It has a lot to do with our executive functioning capabilities. An executive function, think of this as the boss of the brain, the CEO of the brain. This relates to memory, attention, decision-making, learning, the list goes on and on and on. If any of you are familiar with the brief here, the behavior rating scale of executive function, this is an assessment screening instrument that has been studied within the context of dietary patterns and all kinds of other things. This looks at different components of brain functioning, how people shift attention, what is their planning abilities like, with working memory, which is our brain's post-it note. All of these things I'm mentioning here have significant implications for learning. Mental health has been shown to be negatively impacted by the overconsumption of sugar. So if you're ever working with students who have high levels of mental health problems, obviously maybe having that student, if appropriate, working with like a school counselor, and if we have any school counselors in, in our training today or social workers or psychologists, I think it's very, very helpful to truly understand your the clients you serve, their eating habits, how much sugar they consume. That has a lot to do with our mood state, with our energy level, how we manage stress, our anxiety, all of these things really play into academic performance. Excessive sugar consumption has also been linked to having more attentional problems. So again, tension is very important. We need to have good attention capabilities if we're going to be able to focus in the classroom. If you ever have worked with a student that has true ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, we know that folks that have untreated ADHD are typically going to be more impulsive. It can contribute to more academic challenges, problems with decision making, planning, and time management. The research points to the fact that excessive sugar consumption may increase attentional issues. So if you're already working with someone that has like attentional problems, it's just kind of like pouring fuel on the fire. The overconsumption of sugar has also been linked to having more hyperactivity issues. Some studies have looked at the impact that refined and processed sugars have on hyperactivity. High levels of artificial sweeteners and certain food colorings may also increase the risk of hyperactivity. There's all kinds of things that can contribute to hyperactivity issues besides excessive sugar consumption. If someone has low blood sugar levels, so maybe they skip meals, maybe they're not, not taking care of their diabetes if they have that, that can be a factor. If you're ever working with a student that has high degrees of stress, that can impact hyperactivity levels. Some students may have some food sensitivities where they're maybe eating the right foods, but maybe they have some allergic reactions. These are some things to take into account. Sleep is impacted by high amounts of sugar. We know from the research that good sleep can help enhance learning. Poor sleep can have a detrimental impact on the way in which that student learns and retains information. If you look at the research literature on excessive sugar consumption and its impact on sleep, it's been shown to reduce the overall quality of sleep of someone. It can stimulate more appetites and cravings. And if that happens at night, that could throw off our blood sugar levels. It's been linked to having more inflammation. It's also been linked to having more digestive health issues. Why do you wanna care about digestive health issues if you're a college professor? Because there is a direct link between digestive health problems and brain problems. It's a bi-directional link. It's called the gut-brain health access. Excessive sugar consumption can absolutely impact our energy level 
It's been shown to contribute to more impulse control issues. These are all things that are shown to negatively impact sleep. So one of my favorite topics of them all, I give lots of talks on this topic. It's really called the microbiota gut brain health access. If you're in education, learn about this. This explains a lot with our mood, our energy, our thinking. If our gut is off, our brain is off. Our gut is our hub of our immunity. Most of our serotonin is produced in the gut. This is a very important topic to be aware of because what happens in the gut can trigger other parts of the body to not work properly. If you want to study the gut brain health access, I highly recommend learning about the vagus nerve and polyvagal theory. I would recommend learning about the central nervous system. The microbiota is basically the hub of what's going on in the gut. So let's say someone has digestive health issues, something's not working properly in the gut. That's called dysbiosis. If you hear me talk about that term ever, that's basically indicating that the gut is not working properly. Digestive health issues have been linked with more allergies, more asthma, Alzheimer's disease, autism, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, the list goes on and on and on. These are some risk factors for gut problems. This is dysbiosis. High sugar diets have been linked to having more problems in the gut. Just the very nature of dealing with lots of stress, worry, hardship can contribute to this. High levels of obesity have also been linked to having more gut related problems. If you are ever working with students that seem to have a pattern of engaging in excessive behaviors or risk-taking behaviors, in this literature, it does talk about high sugar consumption being one potential factor of many that could indicate that that student may have a tendency to engage in risk-taking behaviors. For some of these students too, this could contribute to more behavioral control problems where in some cases you might have students that are excessively non-compliant, they're more disruptive in the classroom, they seem to never get things done, they're just disrespectful. That Those could be some red flag indicators of maybe some potential risk-taking behaviors. High levels of stress have often been linked to the overconsumption of sugar. Chronic stress and toxic stress exposure is going to be more cumulative, more intense, it's more prolonged, and it can be an overwhelming experience. And over the long haul, chronic stress exposure has been linked to having more brain problems. It can impact learning. It can impact our behavior, and it can also have a detrimental impact on all facets of our body, our sleep, our digestion, and the list goes on. This is the HPA access. I just want to point this out briefly. Another topic I would highly recommend learning about if you're an educator that you probably haven't maybe got training on. This has a lot to do with how humans function. This is called the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access. This is our main stress response system. It's part of our endocrine system. It's a hormone regulator. People that undergo lots and lots of stress, worry, hardship, maybe they have mental health problems, maybe they eat very poorly, that's been shown to negatively impact this access. And when this access is dysregulated, it can increase problems in all areas of functioning, including having more learning challenges, to name a few. Externalizing behaviors, these are going to be things that academic educators can see pretty easily. These might be students that have a tendency to be more aggressive, more loud, more boisterous. They might have a tendency to swear, rule following issues. Excessive sugar intake has been linked to having more externalizing behavioral problems. If you're ever working with students that have had a history of being bullied and teased, this does not just relate to kids in like a K through 12 setting. This can relate to college students as well. Bullying victimization 
has also been linked to having poor dietary habits, and it could be a factor that contributes to an increase in sugar consumption. If you work with students that seem to have problems with alcohol, alcohol dependence, alcohol issues, and excessive sugar intake, according to the research, seem to co-occur in a lot of cases. If you ever work with students that seem to have an unusual relationship with the screen, they seem to have more of an addicted tendency to being, being online, glued to their iPhones, these kind of things. Excessive screen time exposure has also been linked with higher amounts of sugar consumption. So as we get now specifically into sugar-sweetened beverages, I know we're moving through things quickly. We only have an hour today. This is literally like 20 hours of content packed into an hour. Sugar-sweetened beverages are basically beverages that are a liquid carbohydrate. They are a threat to our health without a doubt. They're the single largest source of calories and added sugar in the United States diet. They provide no nutritional value. They can be cold drinks. They can be hot drinks. It's absolutely been linked to all kinds of different health-related problems. This is a really scary statistic, but just being aware of if you add one soft drink to a fast food meal, it increases your content of sugar by tenfold. If someone consumes one sugar sweetened beverage a day, you are at the point of going way over the recommended daily guidelines for how much sugar someone should have. Sugar sweetened beverages, soft drinks can involve colas, flavored water, carbonated waters that are flavored, sweet iced teas, fruit drinks, carbonated soft drinks, fruit punch, the list goes on and on and on. Typically, these drinks obviously are going to be loaded with sugars, different kinds of flavoring. Some have caffeine, some don't. Some are going to have a lot of different food colorings in there. We want to be aware that this has been studied within the context of multiple disorders. And unfortunately, several studies point to the fact that it could increase the risk of heart disease in some cases for some individuals. So really being aware of how this impacts not only our learning, but also our physical health. Some other things to take into account now as we move specifically into college student consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages. Some studies point to the fact that the highest consumer of these beverages are going to be college-age males, and number two are going to be college-age females. Why are we talking about this topic? Because of this particular slide and study. If you're working with college students, there's a high likelihood that your students may be consuming these kind of beverages. Now, on the surface, a lot of people think, what's the big deal? But the research is pretty clear. Excessive sugar sweetened beverage consumptions are related to so many health challenges and it can have a detrimental impact on that student's learning capabilities. What are some factors that we wanna take into account when we're looking at this through a college student lens? Why might this be so much higher than other populations? The research points to the fact it could be related to social factors. So sometimes people, drink these kind of beverages in conjunction with alcohol. Sometimes people drink these beverages just to socialize with friends. Other times, maybe that's the only kind of food they have access to. So being aware, unfortunately, the research on food that is provided on college campuses is kind of concerning in some cases. If you look at some of the research, a lot of college campuses around the United States have tons of vending machines, tons of fast food options. There's actually been several studies that have looked at this. Students sometimes use this to stay awake because some of these beverages are loaded with caffeine. So maybe they're trying to cram in writing a paper, they have finals or midterms. For some of these individuals, they may consume these beverages because they think it's boosting their performance during exercise. A lot of things to take into account. Other factors to consider, this is, 
At the bottom of each of my slides is my full citation. So I'd highly recommend taking a look at some of these studies if you do want to go deeper in the weeds with this topic. But other reasons that college students seem to have a tendency to maybe consume more of these beverages than other populations, the research has looked at personal and environmental correlates. Taste preference has been talked about. What's the student's attitude like around these kind of beverages? So going back, did they drink these beverages in high school? Were they around a lot of friends that drank these beverages? Caregiver modeling behaviors, these kind of things. What were family rules like growing up? Were they living just so close to convenience stores or did they have access to vending machines and they just had a tendency to drink these beverages all day long and it turned into like habit forming kinds of behaviors. So a lot of factors to take into account. Cost is another factor for some students, maybe they don't have a lot of money. Some of these beverages can be actually quite cheap. Obviously they taste good, but they're not good for us. So take that into account. Other things to consider, the research has shown that excessive sugar sweetened beverage consumption is associated with all kinds of different consequences. This research has looked at it within the context of increasing anxiety problems. It's actually been linked to increases in loneliness. Some studies have found that students or individuals who consume a high degree of sugar sweetened beverages may actually be dealing with more loneliness in their day-to-day -day life. It's been shown to contribute to more behavioral problems. Some studies have found that it could be a factor in an increasing sedentary behaviors among some individuals. It's been shown to contribute to more dental problems, obesity issues, kidney-related problems, hypertension, couple studies have looked at this within the context of gout. For some students, it has been linked to having poor grades. There's a couple studies that have shown that excessive sugar sweetened beverage consumption can lower one's grades. The reasons for that is all these things we're talking about, it can impact memory, learning, attention, all of these things. Some studies have shown too, depending on how much some, somebody consumes over the long haul, it could weaken one's bones and increase risk of bone fractures. The list goes on and on and on. There's studies on all of these things. It has been shown to have a profound impact on brain health. Obviously, if you're an academic professional, it's important to understand the brain because that's the hub of learning, attention, memory. All kinds of factors can impact school performance. Sugar sweetened beverage consumption could be one. Sedentary behaviors have been linked to having poor academic performance issues. Some studies have also shown that obesity related issues could impact school performance. Students that are dealing with high levels of stress in their day-to-day -day life, that can be a factor. Some studies have also found that students who skip breakfast, so they don't eat breakfast in the morning, that may be linked to having more school performance issues as well. Some other factors to take into account just in the general sugar sweetened beverage literature. These are some factors and variables that may increase the use of these kinds of beverages. Affordability, again, has been talked about people with lower levels of physical activity, people with lower socioeconomic status may be more likely to consume these beverages at higher degrees. People who, who use a lot of nicotine products, some studies have found that higher use of tobacco and nicotine products may increase the risk of sugar-sweetened beverage consumption. A couple studies have also shown that excessive TV viewing may be a factor in some of these cases. Chronic unemployment is a factor we want to take into account. S chronic sleep issues may increase the risk of sugar sweetened beverage consumption because some people are looking for a quick fix in terms of trying to get a lot more energy. So those are just a few of the variables you'd want to take into account. 
Couple other studies have also looked at the role that peers play. So we really wanna be aware of that student's friendship network as well. So we wanna be aware of peer dynamics that needs to be considered. Some studies have also looked at the role of limited nutritional education. So students that may have lower levels of health literacy or nutritional literacy may consume these beverages at higher levels because they don't understand maybe how to read labels. Maybe they don't understand the health consequences. When we get into interventions, we'll talk about psychoeducation. That's gonna be an important topic. And being aware of proximity, how close does someone live to a fast food joint, a convenience store, a vending machine? These are some of the correlates that may again increase the use of these kinds of beverages. This topic here, allostatic load, if you've never heard of this before, this is wear and tear on the body. This is a physiological dysregulation. So this can contribute to people prematurely aging. It's, a, it's related to chronic stress. It can increase our cortisol levels. Cortisol is a stress hormone. High levels of allostatic load over the long haul have been linked to so many health problems. A lot of factors can contribute to allostatic load besides excessive sugar sweetened beverage consumption, chronic stress exposure, long-term sleep issues, having problems with blood pressure regulation, people that maybe struggle with monitoring or managing their blood sugar levels, People that have nervous system dysregulation, so they might have more physiological dysregulation or brain-based dysregulation. Folks that have higher levels of inflammation in their body, that's been linked to having more allostatic load. So a lot of things to take into account, smoking cigarettes, li living a sedentary lifestyle. People that deal with a lot of social stigma, marginalization, racism, oppression self-esteem issues. These are all things that can contribute to allostatic load. Sugar sweetened beverage consumption has also been linked with having more metabolic dysfunction. Metabolic dysfunction, unfortunately, is very common in our society. Metabolic dysfunction relates to blood sugar dysregulation issues. Maybe somebody has elevated triglyc triglyceride levels, blood pressure issues, weight circumference problems. These are metabolic kinds of risk factors. Metabolic dysfunction has been linked to more obesity problems, cardiovascular risk factors, more problems with like insulin resistance and type two diabetes. It's also been linked with having more non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, sleep problems, depression, all kinds of things. What do we do that can help improve our metabolic health? A lot of common sense things, obviously eating healthier, trying to eliminate sugar sweetened beverages from our diet, getting better sleep, learning how to manage stress, just taking care of our emotional, physical, cognitive health, staying hydrated with proper fluids can be helpful. Meditation can actually be quite helpful. Understanding like mindful, or intuitive eating. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And again, please type questions in the box. We'll try to get to as many as we can at the end. Sugar sweet beverage consumption has also been linked to having more blood sugar dysregulation issues. If you have students who have blood sugar dysregulation issues, that could contribute to that student having more attentional issues in the class. In some cases, they could become more hyperactive. Blood sugar dysregulation has been linked to having more anxiety problems, more irritability, and it can also impact that student's ability to stay on track and to actually listen. Fascinating topics, so being aware that these topics also have significant implications for the classroom. So we've talked about this a few times. Another study, again, that talks about this within the context of sleep. If you have students that deal with excessive daytime sleepiness, they just can't stay awake in the classroom, could that be partially related to excessive sugar-sweetened beverage consumption? Possibly in some cases. 
There's a million reasons why people have sleep problems and may deal with a high degree of sleep-related issues. If appropriate, if your school has resources, referring that student to a healthcare provider, a therapist, encouraging that student to maybe talk to their medical doctor, there could be some other kinds of medical comorbidities going on. Because if that student is chronically tired in your classroom, it's going to be very difficult for that student to engage and retain the information you're teaching them. If you have students that work ship work, there's actually several studies that talk about the harmful effects of shift work. And there's some studies that show that night shift working people that engage in that kind of work behavior might be more likely to consume fast food and sugar sweetened beverages compared to people that work the day shift. Now, nothing against people that work the night shift. I've done, I've done that back in the day when I was in college, but the, the research shows that people that work the night shift consistently over a very long period of time, that can impair the body's ability to process sugar and glucose effectively. It's been shown to throw off our circadian rhythms, which is our sleep-wake cycle. It's also been linked to higher levels of depression, irritability, temperature control issues in our body. And it's also been linked to having more conflict with family. So shift work, some cases can be a threat to our health. There's a lot of studies that show that, but unfortunately for some people, it's unavoidable. It's just the nature of the beast. Night eating syndrome, this is something to be aware of, and this has been studied within the context of university students. This is a type of eating disorder where the person has a tendency to do a lot more eating at night that might contribute to more weight gain. It's been linked to having more anxiety and depression related problems. They may wake up in the middle of the night craving more food, they may be eating a lot more calories at night. So then they eat and then go right to bed. That can throw off their blood sugar levels. That can impact daytime fatigue the next day. This can impact their appetite and actually maybe decrease their appetite in the morning. And they might be more likely to skip breakfast. Remember back to that slide we talked about skipping breakfast has been linked to so many problems. So night eating syndrome, another really important topic to be aware of. So the circadian rhythm I spoke about just a minute ago, this is our sleep wake cycle, excessive sugar sweetened beverage consumption has been linked to having more disruptions in our circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythm disruptions over a long period of time have been studied within the context of alcohol addiction, depression. It may increase the risk of asthma for some people. It has been linked to having more metabolic dysregulation. Some studies have looked at it within the context of neurodegenerative disorders. So it's very important to understand this topic. How do we regulate our circadian rhythms? The research says establish a consistent sleep-wake schedule. That's recommended exercise, consistent meal times, try to avoid heavy eating right before bed, being aware of insulin spikes, taking too long of naps during the day can be that can impact this, being on the screen too late at night. These are all things that can impact our circadian rhythms. Excessive sugar sweetened beverage consumption has also been shown in some cases to contribute to increases in impulse control issues. This is going to be behaviors that are going to be more anxious, more reckless. They're not planning or thinking for the future. Depression may be exacerbated by these types of drinks. I'm not talking about someone that just has one here and there, but excessive consumption of this has been linked to higher levels of depression. People that have experienced high levels of trauma, and I really want people to look at this through a COVID-19 lens. Think of how COVID-19 has been so traumatic for so many people. High levels of trauma exposure have been linked to increases in poor eating habits. So if you work with students who've had a long history of trauma, 
that could be one factor of many. If you've ever worked with students who actually have had a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, a couple studies have found that people with true PTSD may also turn to these kind of beverages. In some cases, they turn to them because it helps calm them down in the short term, but in the long term, it can make symptoms worse. This is a fascinating topic that I highly recommend all educators to learn about as well. It's called alexithymia. This is an emotional awareness deficit where that person has a really hard time naming, labeling, understanding emotions. There's a big emotional block. High levels of alexithymia have also been linked to having more problematic eating patterns. So when we look at this through an academic performance lens, lots of things to take into account. Addictive tendencies to sugar-sweetened beverages have been linked to having more performance issues in the classroom. So very, very important to consider that. And it's also highly important to consider any stress, academic stress that that student may be dealing with that could contribute to this. If you have students in any mathematic classes, actually one study has found that excessive consumption of these kinds of foods and beverages may actually contribute to having more mathematical issues as well. So something to take into account. When we look at this again, going deeper into this through the college lens, why might this be the case? For some students, they may be dealing with higher levels of stress. Going to college is a wonderful thing, but it can also open the door up to a lot of stressors. And if you look at the most common stressors college students deal with, increased responsibility, academic procrastination is a big factor for many students, having a difficult time balancing work life and school life, poor time management issues, daytime fatigue, maybe there's some financial concerns going on. These are all things that can amplify stress in that student. And in some cases, that student may turn to these kind of beverages or unhealthy eating habits to cope with that stress in the short term. Inhibition, this is basically our internal parking brake or pause button. This is our ability to think through things, not to be impulsive. High levels of sugar-sweetened beverage consumption have been linked to more problems in the area of inhibition. That's basically, again, problems with like self-control, impulse control issues. And these factors have also been linked to having more decision-making deficits. I'm actually putting together a training just on energy drink consumption as well, but I just wanted to plant the seed here that energy drink consumption is actually very common among college students as well. These beverages typically contain a high amount of caffeine, obviously, lots of sugars, lots of additives. This can increase alertness, attention, and energy in the short term. But if you look at the research in terms of the consequences associated with excessive energy drink consumption, it's been linked to having more dehydration issues, more anxiety, higher levels of sleep problems. It can impact people's alertness after they crash from the caffeine. So we wanna be aware of caffeine withdrawal symptoms, which could contribute to more headaches, daytime fatigue, irritability, and the list goes on. Aspartame, just wanna introduce you to the topic. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, but aspartame, it's an artificial sweetener. There's been several studies that have looked at high levels of aspartame exposure may contribute to more learning problems, more headaches, migraines, irritable mood states, anxiety, depression, and insomnia, to name a few. As we move into interventions, just some questions to consider. If any of you are like nutrition counselors, if any of you teach classes on health and wellness, just Three good questions to consider when you're like teaching these kind of things. Is the student thriving? Are they just maintaining? Or are they going backwards and regressing? From a recovery lens, like if someone's like a school counselor or 
if you're an academic professional referring your student to like a counselor, focusing on recovery oriented interventions can be very helpful, providing a lot of hope and encouragement and empowerment. Maybe it's some peer support. Maybe there's an actual group where students can go to and be in a group with other people. When I put on my mental health cap lens, this comes out of the mental health world. It's called therapeutic lifestyle changes. These can be very helpful where you're promoting students to maybe exercise more, reduce screen time, getting better sleep. These kind of things can be helpful. Remember before I mentioned that energy drinks could contribute to dehydration. Dehydration has been linked to all kinds of issues. If a student is dehydrated, that can absolutely impact their alertness, their mood state. It's been linked to more thinking problems, more confusion. The student can come off as very sluggish or irritable as well. So dehydration is a real thing to take into account. Early intervention of these things is clearly important. Obviously, we're focusing on college students, but I want all of you just to be aware of the research literature that's called the first thousand days of life. There's a lot of literature that supports the fact that if mothers while pregnant are consuming high levels of sugar sweetened beverages during pregnancy, that's actually been linked to having more problematic birth outcomes. Just something to be aware of, this first thousand days of life literature is fascinating. If any of you are in psychology, criminal justice world, teaching any kind of behavioral class, infusing the first thousand days of life literature into your curriculums would be highly recommended. Teaching students how to have better self-regulation, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with like self-regulated learning, infusing that into the work you do could help reduce this in students. So self-regulated learning approaches are a really helpful intervention to consider. Improving communication by helping students reduce smart time exposure and reducing screen time use has been linked to a reduction in the consumption of these kind of beverages. Promoting self-efficacy. If you can promote self-efficacy in students, they typically have a better belief in their own abilities. There's all kinds of interventions found in the sugar sweetened beverage literature. Self-efficacy interventions is one of many. So remember we talked a little bit about goal setting before, but just focusing on like goal-directed behaviors, understanding the role that this plays in decision-making, problem solving, and even conflict resolution. Enhancing nutritional literacy can be helpful. Teaching students how to read labels, understanding the health effects of these things has been shown to be helpful. I do a lot of trainings in the area of metacognition. This is thinking about thinking, knowing about knowing. It has a, a lot to do with academic performance. It has a lot to do with self-awareness but it also has a lot to do with how we engage in healthy living practices. People with better metacognitive abilities are typically in a better position to make more informed health decisions. People with lower levels of metacognition may make worse decisions that can impact their health and wellness. Helping students get connected to social supports, reducing loneliness, Reducing stress are very important interventions to consider. Students who live a sedentary lifestyle, that is very detrimental to health and wellness. And again, remember sedentary lifestyle behaviors have been linked to increases in these kind of beverages. A brief mindful eating intervention has been talked about in this literature. This is a really good study to take a look at. But if we're talking about brief mindfulness eating, it's just teaching people to slow down, focus on the eating, really recognizing their inner cues, being aware of their senses, has a lot to do with meditation and mindfulness. Psychoeducation interventions have been talked about a lot in this literature too, just the very nature of teaching students about the harmful effects of these kind of beverages have been linked to a reduction in the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages among college students. 
Personalized normative feedback has been talked about too. This is a type of intervention where it helps correct misperceptions that maybe a student has about something. So this might be another intervention to be aware of. It's called personalized normative feedback. This is a really good website I would take a look at. They talk about strategies that can help people reduce sugar sweetened beverage consumption, promoting optimism, promoting gratitude, promoting hopeful thinking, promoting self-esteem, self-awareness, helping people develop a greater satisfaction in life have actually been linked to increases in positive health behaviors, and it's been linked to helping decrease problematic behaviors. Teaching self-compassion has been linked to improve eating habits too. So helping people have greater self-kindness, greater self-empathy for one another has been linked to so many positive outcomes. These are just a few of the outcomes associated with increases in self-compassion. As you can see, they're many and varied. Numerous studies have looked at this. This is a wonderful intervention to maybe try or be aware of. And this is just some other interventions to consider if you're in a college setting, if we have any administrators in the audience today. This is all supported in empirical-based literature. These are just some interventions that have been shown to be helpful at the college arena. So I'm going to open it up to questions, thoughts, concerns. I know we covered a ton of info in a very short amount of time, but I just wanted to plant the seeds with all of you that this has significant implications for learning within the college arena. Thank you, everyone. So we have a couple of questions already. Um, someone asked, what about beverages with artificial sweeteners like diet pops or juices? Would they have similar effects? It depends. We talked just a little bit about aspartame before. So some of those would have some of those artificial ingredients. There is some literature that has pointed to the fact that it could increase issues of hyperactivity and attentiveness. Maybe some people have some sensitivity to those kind of things. So working with a nutritionist can be very helpful. Again, today, I don't want to provide any nutritional advice, but the research shows that some of those artificial beverages too can be very problematic to health and wellness. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, does sugar in fruit and fruit juices also have a negative effect? There's been a, quite a few studies that have looked at sugar sweetened beverages and then juices that are 100% juice. We still want to be aware that those 100% juices have a ton of sugar in them. So basically what the research has shown that the overconsumption of even some of those 100% juices can be problematic. Are they as problematic as sugar sweetened beverages? Um, probably not, it, it would depend on the study, but just think, those sugar sweetened beverages and 100% fruit juices, they're liquid, so they're going to be absorbed into the bloodstream very quickly and they can spike our insulin levels and our glucose levels. And we want to really be aware that dysregulation in our blood sugar levels are linked to so many problematic health outcomes. So that's what I'd say about that. Thank you. Um, what role and impact does toxic stress play into this topic? Toxic stress is cumulative. It's prolonged. Stress can be good in the short term. Toxic stress is always bad. So toxic stress exposure has been linked to increases in inflammation in our body. It's been shown to throw off our blood sugar levels. For some people that have very poor coping skills, under great deals of stress, in some cases, they may turn to drugs, alcohol, tobacco products, caffeine, sugar-sweetened beverages. I do a lot of work in the area of the adverse childhood experiences research. And what that research shows is that kids growing up who were exposed to high levels of toxic stress that went untreated or unmanaged, there's a greater likelihood as they get older, they're going to have more problems in school. They're going to have more problems in the social arena. They'll have more mental health challenges. And they can have unusual relationships with eating habits as well. Thank you. 
Um, what impact does, does excessive sugar sweetened beverage consumption have on learning? All the, all the things we've talked about, so it can impact the hippocampus, it can impact the prefrontal cortex. There are studies that show that it impacts decision-making, problem-solving. It can have a profound impact on attention and hyperactivity issues. All of these things, if present in a student, are huge barriers for learning. It can get in the way of academic performance. So I definitely, if send me an email, I can send you my slides. All of those articles that we covered today, there'd be some wonderful resources in there, but it is a threat to academic performance. The research is pretty clear on that. Thank you. Would you mind sharing your um, email address once again so that people can jot it down? And then if you have any closing remarks. Yeah, let me, I'll type it into the Q&A here. It's an interesting topic that professors, academic folks don't think about too much, but it has significant implications for, again, attention, learning, memory. Don't hesitate, reach out to me. I have lots of resources on this. And if you're looking to go deeper with this topic, you can find several podcasts I've done online related to a lot of these topics. I have lots of podcasts on YouTube. I go on lots of national and international podcasts related to these topics. And I've also published some different articles related to sugar consumption. So if you want some links to those, just reach out to me. And thank you everyone for again, taking time out of your day to listen to me chat. And if you have any other questions, I'll definitely stick around. We do have one more question. Yeah, well, that's actually a two part question. Um, would you say that SSB are worse than bad food diet since uh, these are empty calories? And what about alcohol? Well, sugar sweetened beverage consumption would fall under the category of these empty calories and bad food diet, which would relate to the Western diet. It would relate to ultra processed foods. So that is a component of a bad diet and empty calories. In terms of alcohol, some of the research has shown that students that have alcohol-related problems may be more likely to consume higher levels of sugar-sweetened beverages, as well as energy drinks. And there's some studies that have shown that students who consume a lot of alcohol in conjunction with energy drinks, it actually increases their risk of vulnerability and victimization as well. So a lot of studies on that. And that's a topic that I'm actually in the process of putting together another training on. Again, it's the implications that energy drink consumption has on college student populations. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, looks like that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you, Professor Brown, and thank you all for attending. We will be emailing you a link to the recording of this webinar once it's available. If you or any of your fellow instructors are, excuse me, are interested in presenting for our learning and growing webinar series, please submit your proposals to the learning and growing web website, which I'm going to go ahead and link in the chat right now for easy access. Excuse me. <clears throat> These free webinars are brought to you by Hawks Learning, um, an innovative educational courseware company. To learn more about our mastery-based course materials and how Hawks can enhance learning outcomes for you and your students, please visit hawkslearning.com. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. And thank you for all for attending today's webinar.